It's now time for question period. The member from Lambton Kent Middlesex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. Premier, I listened to the fall economic statement yesterday, and while I appreciate a nice story with a happy ending, this isn't the time or place for fiction. We continue to rely on rosy assumptions about the growth of our economy in spite of the half a billion dollar shortfall you announced yesterday and in the face of a flagging economic outlook globally. In just the last few weeks, we've learned Japan and Italy are officially in recession. Germany struggled to grow its economy by 0.1% last quarter, and China's growth is continuing to slow. Yesterday, UK Prime Minister David Cameron cautioned, and I quote, red warning lights are once again flashing on the dashboard of the global economy. <coughs> Premier, how can you expect the people of Ontario to believe that you'll balance the budget without raising their Question. taxes when you keep overestimating revenue and won't stop spending? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate I appreciate the global context that the member opposite has uh, has painted, and uh, those are realities that we are contending with. But, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan, and we are executing the plan that we ran on, Mr. Speaker. And that plan is multifaceted. It is not one thing. The uh, the, the party opposite had one song that they sang during the election campaign. Their only thought was to cut and slash fire people and cut services. That is not a plan, Mr. Speaker. That is a recipe for disaster. What we have said is that we have to make investments that will allow for job growth now and in the future and economic support for communities Answer. in the future. We have said we have to constrain spending and we have a program review in place, Mr. Speaker, that is going to allow us to do that. Thank you. And we've said we have to partner with the private sector. Thank you. Well, speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, I know you don't have a background of business or experience meeting a payroll, but let me tell you this. Premier, a small business that grows its debt year Order. Start the clock. Order, please. Finish, please. Premier, a small business that grows its debt year after year wouldn't get back in the black just by raising its prices and cracking down on kids pocketing a few candy bars. <laughs> it's clear that much more fundamental change is needed in this province. The debt is nearly $300 billion, and you, Premier, are paying $29 million a day just to service the debt. Premier, can you Question? tell us exactly how this government is going to significantly reduce spending? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Premier. Let me just say to the member opposite that I believe that government and society needs leadership that brings life experience to those roles that allows a complex solution to complex problems. That's what leadership is, Mr. Speaker. confronted with a complex problem, and I would just remind the member opposite that actually the government of Ontario is not a small business. The government of Ontario is a government responsible for the life and livelihood. The government of Ontario is a, a government that is responsible for the life and livelihood of 13.6 million people in this Bruce province. Sound come to order. It is a complex enterprise. It's a complex society. And so the plan that we have to review the programs Answer. and transform them with this government, Mr. Hastings Speaker, as well. to manage compensation costs, to ensure that everyone pays their fair share of taxes, and to unlock the value of the, the assets that, are, that belong you. to the people of Ontario, that's the complexity that that we Thank bring you. to this task, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, with no real intention to get spending under control, you've said you'll rely on cigarettes to balance the books. You have presented strengthening revenue integrity as if it was a re re revolutionary idea, but in fact, it's simply an, an admission that your government has failed to protect 
protect tax dollars. Either you have been unable or unwilling to enforce these laws, properly collect taxes, or deliver on old promises to crack down on contraband tobacco. If, in fact, there is significant revenue to be found from stopping this, quote, revenue leakage, as you call it, how many millions or billions of dollars has this government lost over the last decade by failing to enforce its own laws? Premier. Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, again, I, I understand that the questions that are written down and the, uh, the decisions that are made about the way the question is going to go are made before question period, but I really think that this is an important discussion that we should be having about how we solve a problem that, quite frankly, we are all in together. As the member opposite outlined, there are global forces that we are all dealing with. We have put in place a plan that, yes, speaks to making sure that there is revenue integrity, that the revenue that should be coming into the provincial coffers comes into the provincial coffers, while at the same time making sure that we pay attention to the economic development of all our communities across the province. If the member opposite looks at the work that we have done in, for example, in the Ministry of Health over the last number of years and has, has, can look at the yes, transformation sir. that has taken place and the way spending has been constrained, Mr. Speaker, and the way costs have been controlled and the limits on growth that we have Thank put you. in place there, he would understand what's possible, Mr. Speaker. Question. Same member. Well, Speaker, my next question is for the Premier. Premier, in 2010, the Liberal government of the day, of which you were the Minister of Education, retracted its controversial plans to introduce a new sex education curriculum in our schools and promised to widely consult with parents before attempting another sex ed revision. But Stop. Stop. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, you will come to order. Please continue. Premier, just a few weeks ago, your Minister of Education suddenly announced that there would be a new sex education curriculum in place for the 2015 school year. And yet, Premier, there have been no meaningful consultations with Ontario parents on this issue. My question this morning, Premier, is very simple. Why have you decided to break the 2010 Liberal promise to consult with parents before reintroducing new changes to Ontario's sex education? Question, thank you. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, quite the contrary. We have followed through on that commitment, and the Minister of Education has announced a process whereby parents across the province will be consulted. Parents, well, and I will just say, you know, the, the notion that somehow the chair of the school council, the representative of the school council, that, that somehow that person doesn't have access to the school population just demonstrates how little this party opposite actually understands about how education works, Mr. Speaker. And to that, to that life experience point that I made earlier, I've been the chair of a school council. I've been a school trustee. I've worked in community. I understand that the role of a school council chair is to talk to the people in his or her school, to get that input, and then to feed that input into a process. That's how it's worked. How it works, Mr. Speaker. And we promised Answer. we would consult with parents. That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. Well, Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier. One carefully selected, hand-picked parent per school represents only 4,000 parents out of millions of Ontario parents. That's barely 1% of parents, Premier. This Order. is not consultation. For the minister to suggest that such a covert process of education constitutes a meaningful consultation is an insult to the intelligence of parents right across this province. It is simply smoke and mirrors, Premier. Premier, when will you reveal the contents of the new Liberal sex education curriculum so all parents in the province can see for themselves what you have planned for their children? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll just quickly answer the first part of that question and say that what is an insult to the people of the province, and particularly to the hardworking volunteers in, in all of the schools in this province, is that this member wouldn't understand that those volunteer roles are extremely important, that they do connect with the parents in their schools, and that they have a very important role to play. And he really should learn that, Mr. Speaker, if he's going to be able to represent his school. I want to say something else. I, and I want to 
say something else, Mr. Speaker, to the second part of the question. I believe that what this is really about, what this is really about, is that this member wants to once again undermine the real, the very real need for a strong and updated and modern sex education, physical and health education curriculum in our schools. Answer. I would think that given the uh, the issues that we have dealt with as a society in the last few weeks, he would have Thank begun you. to understand that. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, even this flimsy promise to consult the tiny, hand-picked select group of parents is a farce. On Thursday, October 30th, your Minister of Education suggested that it was unlikely that any feedback, even from these people, would have an impact on your Liberal government. Stop the clock, please. The uh, Minister of Education will come to order. Please finish. Premier, this is another Liberal broken promise, another example of Liberal contempt for voters and parents in the province of Ontario. Premier, it seems you are afraid of telling parents what you intend to teach their children. Why don't you simply release the details of the proposed Liberal sex education curriculum now? And Premier, what are you trying to hide? Thank Premier. you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, here is my advice to the member opposite in answer to his question, that is to go to the schools in his riding to talk to the elected chairs of the school councils, because they are elected by the parents in the school, and to have a conversation with them about what they think should be in the physical and health education curriculum, because that is the consultation that we're doing. But, Mr. Speaker, I just want to point out that there are members of this party that have called for a select committee to look into sexual harassment and sexual assault. I have said that I'm open to making changes and that that's a conversation that House leaders can have. But that flies in the face of what this member is doing, Mr. Speaker, which undermines, undermines if he doesn't think, if he doesn't think that at a select committee we would hear how important it is for. Uh, it goes both ways. I'm, uh, I'm not getting quiet for uh, people to take their last cheap shots. And it's reached a point of uh, regret for me. Please. Any discussion about the needs for children to learn about sexual harassment and Answer. sexual assault, there will be and necessarily a discussion about health and physical education curriculum in schools. Those two things Thank are you. necessarily linked, Mr. Speaker. Your question, later the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Liberal government released its fall economic statement. Ontario's bank account is short half a billion dollars. The Liberals are slashing 6% out of nearly every ministry, and now we're finding out that they're short in revenues. What's the Premier going to do to cover the losses, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I know that uh, I know that the leader of the third party understands our uh, un understands our plan, understands the fiscal underpinnings of our plan because she ran on that plan, Mr. Speaker. She understands that we have a path to balance. She understands that we are looking at uh, we're looking at our assets, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they are working for the people of Ontario. She understands that we are constraining compensation, Mr. Speaker, and she understands that we are working to transform the programs as we have done across government we will continue to do to make sure that we are providing the services that people in this province need but that we are providing them in the most cost effective way possible mr. speaker at the same time making investments that will allow the economy to thrive those investments in transportation infrastructure in transit roads and bridges around the province mr. speaker that we know communities Mayor need Hamilton, in order to draw business to that's the plan I know she's aware of it mr. speaker because as I say she yes, ran sir. on it 
Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, when the government released its fall update, we found out that Liberal mismanagement has left revenues $5 billion lower than projected since the 2010 budget. But instead of looking for ways to ensure that we can actually pay the bills, the Liberals are handing a brand new tax loophole to corporations so that they can write off the HST on leaf, on leaf tickets and the company car. Steve Orsini, former Deputy Minister of Finance and now the Premier Secretary of Cabinet, says this loophole will cost $750 million annually. Now, when we're falling short on revenues and we're slashing services to people, does the Premier really think it's wise to open up a new corporate tax loophole? Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Finance will want to uh, speak to the specifics, but again, let me say that um, we, we, presented our, uh, we presented our fall economic statement yesterday to the people of the province, and we are, we are very confident, given what has been happening in the province, given, Mr. Speaker, that our unemployment rate is at 6 5%. That's the lowest rate since uh, October 2008, Mr. Speaker. Given, mis th given, Mr. Speaker, that those jobs are 90% full-time jobs, 37,000 uh, net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, uh, last month in October. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we are seeing an uptick. Absolutely, absolutely, there are challenge ahead, as challenges ahead of us, and we have we've acknowledged that. Yes, but sir. we have a plan. We understand that there has to be constraints, and at the same time, we must make those investments that will allow the economy Thank to thrive. You. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker. Another way to increase revenues is certainly to grow the economy, but we learned that the Liberals will be missing their growth targets that they just set five months ago, pre-election, Speaker. That didn't take long, now did it? We won't hit the ground. We won't hit the growth targets, rather, in any Deputy of the House next Leader. four years coming, is what that economic statement said. Four more years, Speaker, of lost revenues. Four more years of slashed services. Does the Premier really think her plan's working, Speaker? Minister of Finance. Sure, finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. I understand that the member opposite is talking about our path to balance and our stimulus package, both combined to achieve the positive results that are necessary. She referenced the fact that revenues are down by half a billion dollars, which is correct. Noted earlier, because of global forces, and what have we done? We've recalibrated and reassessed it to ensure that we continue to balance and we meet our targets. But the member opposite is basing her assumptions on our platform. Now, I know it's difficult for her to read more than nine pages as she's written on hers. <laughs> Ours is a little bit more complex than that, and it's fully detailed, and it's out there for all to use and recognize. We will achieve our target. We're balancing our books by 2017-18, and we're stimulating growth as necessary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question. The well, Speaker, the third we part. certainly didn't include billions of dollars of new corporate tax loopholes in our plan. Oh, yeah. Speaker. My next question is to the Premier. In yesterday's economic statement, the government has admitted for the very first time that they will not meet, that they didn't meet, in fact, their 8% uh, auto insurance premium reduction. Now they're saying that the rates may come down 6%. Now, the action's over, Speaker. The government uh, has, uh, has uh, been backing away in this economic statement from the promise that they made, made just a few months ago to reduce rates by 15 per cent. Now, is the Premier going to keep her promise to reduce those rates by 15 per cent, Speaker, or is this fall economic statement really an admission that they're going to go nowhere near 15 per cent? Mr. Speaker, Speaker, again, the Minister of Finance will, uh, will want to speak on the specifics, but let me just be clear. What we have said in the fall economic statement and what we have said consistently is that, that auto insurance rates are down. They have already come down, Mr. Speaker. We are already seeing success, and we will continue to work to make sure that we reach those targets. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that the work that we have done so far and the changes that have been made, those have already, those have already produced results. The fact is that the members opposite need to look at the legislation that we brought forward because in that legislation are the mechanisms to remove fraud from the system to make further changes that will continue to bring those auto insurance on average down across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, in the fall economic statement, the government appears to be backing away from their promise to cut auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. That's the bottom line. And they're using something called the Annual Automobile Insurance Transparency and Accountability Experts Report as the reason why they're backing away. But this report, Speaker, is so transparent that it's being kept from the public. Can the Premier explain why her transparency report that underpins her economic statement and her broken promise on auto insurance is being kept from the public, Speaker? Mr. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's pretty rich, i got to tell you. We're in the midst of trying to look at legislation on auto insurance, which the member opposite and her team voted against. Against. voted against the very measures to reduce auto insurance further. Had we taken the steps as we proposed, Months ago, we would have reduced auto insurance even more. Notwithstanding, auto insurance rates are down. The uh, member from Eglinton Lawrence will come to order, and the member from Hamilton East Tony Creek will come to order. Finish, please. So auto insurance rates are down on average by 6% because of the measures we've taken to date. We need to do more. We need to do the necessary work around fighting fraud. We have to go against dispute resolution systems. We're looking also at a number of initiatives around the tow truck industry and a number of initiatives that are enabled us to reduce yes, costs in the courts. That was necessary months ago. They stopped it. They delayed it. They voted against it. We're going to make sure it gets passed Thank now you. and reduce rates even further. Final supplementary. Well, in fact, what they've done is taken away people's rights to sue and have justice in terms of auto insurance disputes. The economic statement, the economic statement has real impacts on people across Ontario. Our growth is not keeping up. That means losing out over a billion dollars worth of jobs, investments, and prosperity. Bills are going up for hydro, and they're not coming down for auto. And people are wondering if they're going to be facing more cuts and more privatized services because the Liberals have emptied the piggy bank. Does the Premier still think her plan is progressive, Speaker? Sir. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite ran on our platform says that she's going to find $600 million more in savings and in cuts to health care and education that she said she would be able to find. And now she's saying, well, we don't want to do that either. So you can't have it both ways. We are taking the steps necessary to transform government through the work that the President of the Treasury Board is doing now. We're going to make certain that we provide for open and, uh, and collective agreements that honour and respect the rights of others, but ensuring that we have net zero so that we can all be in this together. We're going to continue to invest in those matters that are important to Ontarians to promote and increase our growth. And Mr. Speaker, she makes reference to tax loopholes, which are wrong. We have revenue leakage that we are, that we are attacking, but what she makes reference to is incorrect. She knows that fully well that we need the federal government support in those initiatives that Answer. we do not have. We're fighting hard for Ontario. She should fight hard for Ontario as well, instead of putting them down and making absolute accusations. Any question? The member from Nipissing. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. The Bank of Canada and the Conference Board of Canada both forecast that you would not make your revenue numbers this year. Uh, but you didn't listen to the experts and you put a high revenue number in your budget. Well, surprise, the experts were right again and you were wrong again. Revenues came in half a billion dollars lower than you told us it would be, and that's only four months ago. And you raided our reserves again, 300 million more out of the piggy bank, so it doesn't look as bad as it really is. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce has concluded, quote, we are likely to reach a state of crisis unless the province cuts spending Question. and changes the way it does business. Premier, will you please listen to the experts in the financial community and finally change the way you Thank do you. business in Ontario? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, the premise of the question is completely inaccurate. Oh. And I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker. We have we have independent economists around the world and across Canada 
assessing the degree of revenue that we would be achieved. In fact, we had Don Drummond last year look at the integrity of the revenue numbers that were projected by independent economists outside of government. We took those projections and pared it down even further. We were below their projected amounts. And even still, we were able to use the shock absorbers that had been built into the system. That's why it exists. And it's also why we're borrowing $24 billion less and have $200 million in lower interest costs because of the efforts that we're taking to offset these very measures. We're moving ahead. We're on target to balance the budget by 2017-18 by taking a balanced yes, approach, Mr. Speaker. Quite a, quite a pant load there. Premier, we've seen the direct result of your spending spree. I'm going to ask you to withdraw that. Withdraw. Carry on. You've already cut 1,600 nursing jobs, physiotherapy for seniors, cataract surgeries, and diabetes testing strips. Premier, you're the one holding the knife today. It's not getting any better. Your own plan shows you need to raise revenue $15 billion by 2017-18 to balance the budget. President but you've Treasury missed your Board revenue Governor. targets every single time. So, Premier, what are you going to do now? Are you going to raise taxes, as mentioned twice yesterday, more health cuts to, uh, in addition to the ones you've already done, or are you going Question. to legislate the wage freeze your finance minister announced in this House yesterday? So, Mr. Speaker, we have adopted now over 80 percent of Don Drummond's recommendations. We've taken measures of austerity in a very pragmatic and appropriate way by transforming government without hampering services in health care and education especially and for our social well-being. But, Mr. Speaker, as a result of that, we've become the lowest cost government per capita in Canada. Yeah. So it's th we've done our job in that regard. What we will not do, though, Mr. Speaker, is cut 100,000 jobs from the system and put people at risk is what he's been applying for and what he's been suggesting. Instead, we have a net increase of 500,000 net new jobs since the recession. We've recovered the 300,000 plus of 500,000 more, and unemployment rate now in Ontario is 6.5%, 1% lower than last year. We're continuing to do what's necessary to promote the economy and continue to manage our program spending as necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. According to the Fall Economic Statement, the first annual Automobile Insurance Transparency and Accountability Expert Report was delivered to the Minister of Finance. Now, the whole point of this annual report was to let the public know why premiums were so high despite the fact that the insurance industry was saving billions of dollars flowing from the draconian benefit cutbacks of 2010 and subsequent years. But this government has refused to release this so-called transparency report to the public. Minister, why haven't you released this report to the public? And what is in this report that you're so afraid of showing to the millions of Ontario drivers in Ontario? Minister Finance. The real question, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, is why did you vote against the very bill that would lower auto insurance in the first place? Why were you not standing up for the people of Ontario and the very drivers that you claim to be supporting? We've been able to reduce rates by 6% on average. We can reduce rates even more by in, uh, imposing and providing the legislation that we brought forward that will be debated in this House, that will be debated on committee, that will enable us to have that discussion, which you are trying to avoid. And I've got to tell you, I'm disappointed at the very nature of your question because you, of all people, stood in this House trying to claim and support auto insurance uh, drivers to produce their rates, just like many private members' bills on this House the House have fought for. We'll continue to do our part. You should be joining yes, us sir. in doing it as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was going to make a great quote and answer. The minister is disappointed that I asked him to release, release a transparency report. We're going to definitely quote that in transfer. You Democrats have long argued that the insurance industry has pocketed $2 billion, billion from the 2010 benefit cutbacks without passing a penny on to drivers. That's why we called for a 15 per cent premium rollback, which we thought this government agreed to in the 2013 budget. But it's pretty clear now they have no intention of implementing it. Minister, you admitted yesterday 
that the 15% rate reduction is stalled at 6%. But you didn't say why. What's in the transparency report that you refuse to release? Again, what are you hiding from the 8 million drivers in Ontario? Minister. Oh, Mr. Speaker, we have a, a regulatory system that forces the companies to post online their rates, their activities, and the reductions they're at, that they are proceeding with. There's over 100 companies that are competing. Almost 20 of them or more are actually well above the 50% reduction in rates already, and we can encourage that activity to proceed. And that is transparent. And I got to tell you, the reason why rates are at only 6% is very clear. It's because you've stalled the very legislation that enables rates to go down, because you voted against it, because you enabled an election that wasn't necessary, and those are the issues that are creating uh, the, the slowing of that rate reduction now. We're going to act quickly. We're going to ensure that rates are reduced by taking the actions necessary in this piece of legislation, you, which I hope you will support in the end. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Ottawa South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Devel the Development of North Northern Development, excuse me, and mine. Minister, in your mandate letter, the Premier made it clear that we made it our government's priority to ensure that Ontario's North continues to realize its potential as a sustainable, diverse, stable, and innovative region that uh, significantly contributes to the overall growth of Ontario's economy. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain? What our government is doing to drive growth in Northern Ontario. Thank you, Minister of Northern Development. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to the member for Ottawa South for that great question. And certainly, it's a complete priority for our government to ensure that our northern <coughs> communities uh, continue to remain on a positive uh, track towards prosperity. And that's one of the reasons why we are continuing to work so hard on the implementation of the Northern Ontario Growth Plan. And we're diversifying the economy, helping communities attract investment, and building more e efficient infrastructure. And the key, we believe, Mr. Speaker, is to take a very collaborative approach. And that's why. We are directly engaging municipal, Aboriginal, and community leaders from across northern Ontario. We held the Northern Leaders Forum in Timmins last December, followed that up with a very, very positive session in Thunder Bay. And may I say, Mr. Speaker, we are looking forward to continuing that dialogue with another Nor Northern Leaders Forum early in the new year happening in Sault Ste. Marie. Looking Answer. forward to it. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for informing the House, uh, forming this legislature about the strategic investments our government is making in northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we need to ensure that we continue to support the talent and skills of all Ontarians so that we can build a dynamic business climate in our province, one that thrives on innovation, creativity and partnerships. I think that we would all agree that successful development relies on the modern and efficient infrastructure, a vital component of building prosperous communities. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to improve infrastructure in Northern Ontario and support growth across the region? Thank you, the Minister. Another great question. Thank you so much. I mean, certainly we know that infrastructure is absolutely a, a vital part of uh, realizing the, the full potential of our northern communities, which is why we're so proud of, uh, of the, this last year's investment of $527 million for northern highways, which is about one four, 147 million for expansion, 380 million for rehabilitation. <coughs> Actually, uh, over $5 billion over the last 10 years. We made a $32 million investment to support the expansion of broadband, broadband infrastructure to 21 First Nation communities, an additional $30 million in projects extending broadband coverage to over 96% of northern Ontario homes. We're going to get all the way there. We've launched a new Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, providing um, annually now, permanently, $100 million per year to small, rural and northern municipalities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's, it's important to note these are priorities for us. We never heard a thing from the uh, opposition party during the campaign last year at all about yes, a certain plan. We're very proud of our northern plan, and it's a total priority of Premier Wynn and our government. Thank you. New question, member from Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my uh, question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, your revolving door of excuses is getting old and tired. Your newest excuse is trying to pull the wool over taxpayers' eyes by telling us the Mars loan is fully secure. Minister, CBRE's most recent appraisal pegs valued building at $303 million, if 100% leased. You've blown $224 million on the loan, $65 million more on ARE. And now we're on the hook for 106.5 million in interest. That's a lot more than 300 million, Minister. 
You're like the Energizer Minister. You just keep digging and digging and digging us into a deeper hole. Minister, you're planning on cutting our losses and selling the building or just keep pouring millions more Question. into a bad deal you should have never signed off on in the first place. Mr. Mr. Speaker, what's getting old and tired is the, the members' daily attacks on the integrity of Mars, Mr. Speaker, and the, and the opportunities that Mars brings to our bioscience cluster. Mr. Speaker, if the member was really concerned about the economy and jobs, he'd be supporting our bioscience cluster in the efforts that Mars makes to, to grow jobs and attract investment, Mr. Speaker. But there's a big difference between that party and this party. Yes, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, when when, when the Mars Phase II project was having challenges, we did step up and provide support to ensure that that building did not rot in the ground. His party would have let that building rot in the ground. He would have kissed away the jobs that are going to come from the work that Mars does, Mr. Speaker, and the economic development and the investment that that will attract to this province, Mr. Speaker. Answer. I will not be taking his advice. I'm looking forward to the advice of Michael Nobrega and Carol Stevenson, who will help us ensure that this project becomes a success. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister. We know that you don't understand the business case, and no one's surprised now that you don't understand the appraisal either. Your appraisal just doesn't add up. Both CBRE and Altus based their valuations of Mars on it being fully leased to tenants paying research and life science spaces. Yet we know there is no market for the 780,000 square feet of research space. But we do know you're planning to put bureaucrats in there and the market value for office space is eight to ten dollars a square foot less than research space. That means the value of the building is tens of millions of dollars less, even when it is fully rented. Minister, can you tell this house exactly how many millions more is Mars 2 worth when filled with bureaucrats instead of scientists? Or are you just going to pass this off to the finance minister as more leakage next year? Thank you. Speaker, the PC's party's approach to uh, dealing with the challenges faced by Phase 2 Mars was to let that building rot in the ground, Mr. Speaker. That was their approach, but it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us because, Mr. Speaker, when things get tough, Tories run and hide. Look what they did with the auto sector, Mr. Speaker, when the auto sector was having challenges. Mr. Speaker, we stepped up, partnered with the auto sector, ensured that 400,000-plus direct and indirect jobs were saved in this province. Mr. Speaker, the, the approach of that party was to let those plants close. Mr. Speaker, when it comes down to it, this party has the intestinal fortitude to make the investments we need to make to grow our economy, to partner with the private sector, Mr. Speaker, where necessary, to make the important business business decisions going forward that are responsible yes, to taxpayers, that are going to create jobs and grow our economy. That party you. clearly does not, Mr. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Education. Speaker, on July 9th, the Premier stood in this House and said, quote, we're not going to cut education. No. Yesterday, the economic update poured cold water on that Liberal promise. The Liberals have quietly admitted they're actually planning a half a billion dollars in wow. cuts to schools in this province. The 2015 Education Funding Guide shows up to $500 million in cuts by 2017. Why did the Premier promise Ontarians no cuts to education while asking you, Minister, to slash $500 million in crucial funding to our schools? Wow. Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think one of the things that you need to recognize is that, in fact, we have increased spending in education more than any other government has ever done. In fact, the, 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 on average, the per pupil spending has increased anywhere from 50 to 60 percent, depending on where the board is in uh, Ontario, Speaker. So I absolutely challenge anyone who says that we are that we are not uh, funding education properly. It is true that we have declining enrollment. 
and that when you find that enrollment is declining, Answer. that there may be individual boards who, because they've had dramatic declines in enrollment, may not have had as much funding Thank you. this year as last. But the Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier said one thing, and now she's doing the opposite. Her budget promised increased funding to school boards to keep up with growing enrollment. She's on the record promising no cuts to schools, and yet the Ministry of Education is spelling out $500 million in cuts to our classrooms and says annual increases are things of the past. These cuts will hurt an education system that's already hurting from being underfunded. It could mean ballooning class sizes, teacher layoffs, and even more school closures. Will the minister tell Ontarians exactly what this cut of half a billion dollars will mean to the students, teachers, and education workers of this province? Good question. Thank you. Yes. Well, let me repeat. The funding is now at $22.5 billion through the grants for student needs. That represents an increase of 56.5 per cent, or for over $4,000 per pupil since 2003. The funding has gone up. In fact, in the area that he's talking about this year, which is looking at some of the operating issues, we've actually uh, added um, eight point $8.3 million to help boards with planning. We've added $15.5 million to help them invest in uh, teaching staff in remote areas of the province where we know that the schools are going to remain open. We're actually increasing the funding so that those schools can remain open. Answer. But uh, the bottom line here is, yes, the funding keeps going up, the per-pupil funding. New question? The uh, member from Burlington. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Research and Innovation and Training, Training Colleges and Universities. Minister, Ontario has some of the best educated, hardest working, and most creative young people in the world. Many of them live in my riding of Burlington, where I've had the privilege of meeting post-secondary students who are eager to transform their bright ideas into successful businesses. However, what I'm finding out is that many of them are not aware of the programs, tools, and services that the government makes available to them to develop their entrepreneurial skills and launch their own company. Minister, I understand that the response to Ontario's youth job strategy has been very strong. Our government is well on its way of achieving its target of connecting 30,000 young people with job opportunities. Minister, can you please tell the members of this House what steps our government is taking to support young entrepreneurs and help them thrive in today's market economy? Thank you, Minister Tom Cogman. Thank you, Mr. Minister Speaker. Minister. I want to thank the member from Burlington for that very good question, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. This week is uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Week, so the question is great. Mr. Speaker, building a culture of innovation, research excellence, and entrepreneurship are the, at the heart of our government's jobs and economic strategy. We recognize that the economy needs the, a culture of startups and the workers who derive creativity and competitiveness in the new world economy. That's why entrepreneurship programs form the, a key part of our government's new job strategy. Mr. Speaker, Ontario Youth Entrepreneurship Fund provides young people with mentorship and special capital and the seed capital to start their own businesses. And the Ontario Youth Innovation Fund helps young innovators get the advanced work experience and the startup support they need to translate their research into the 21st century economy. Mr. Speaker, helping young people get the experience and resources they need to launch their own companies is part of our government's plan yes, to develop an innovative business climate in this province. We will continue to build Ontario up, Mr. Speaker, by investing in a suite of programs and services that will help Thank young you. people turn their ideas and dreams into reality. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is great to hear that our government is taking the necessary steps to help our young people become successful entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Minister, post-secondary education plays a crucial role in preparing the next generation of Ontario's entrepreneurs. It is imperative that our government invest in student entrepreneurship at the post-secondary level in order to provide our future leaders with the tools they need to succeed in tomorrow's economy. Investing in a dynamic, innovative and entrepreneurial post-secondary system will nurture our business visionaries, ignite their entrepreneurial spirit and help them grow Ontario's economy. Speaker, can the minister tell us more about the different on-campus programs being offered to young entrepreneurs 
and how our government is building a dynamic, entrepreneurial, post-secondary system in our province. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member again for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government understands the importance of investing in students' entrepreneurship in the 21st century global economy. This is, that's why our government is building the most entrepreneurial post-secondary system in North America by investing $25 million in two dynamic on-campus programs. The first one, Mr. Speaker, is campus-linked accelerators are providing funding to institutions to integrate on-campus entrepreneurial activities with the local businesses and industry. And the second program, Mr. Speaker, is the on-campus entrepreneurship activities program is helping to start business activities within the institutions. I am proud, Mr. Speaker, to report that out of 44 Ontario post-secondary system, 42 of them now have on-campus entrepreneurship programs. Wow. These programs are giving students yes, the sir. chance to develop their business ideas while at the same time transforming our post-secondary institutions, Mr. Speaker, into entrepreneurship Thank hubs. You. Mr. Speaker, we are producing some of the best. Thank you. New question, the Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. My question is for the Premier. Premier, last week uh, I received an email from a local uh, news organization indicating that your government plans to approve by the end of November WPD's application to build eight 500-foot-tall wind turbines, structures that will be as tall as the TD Tower here in Toronto, directly beside the Collingwood Regional Airport. Now, I've raised this issue, as you know, many times with your government over the years. You yourself uh, visited the area just before you became leader, and you said that this specific project should not go ahead in the face of community opposition. And you've also said that an airport should not have to shut down because of wind turbines. So, Premier, is it true? Are you going to approve these 500-foot wind turbines in proximity to the Collingwood Airport? <laughs> Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 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 that's enough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, the, there's an environmental assessment process for these things as well, of which the public has a chance to comment. But, Mr. Speaker, airports and airport standards are regulated by the federal government, and we've had this debate uh, uh, with members opposite. And uh, you know, we have federal transportation minister who doesn't like to return provincial ministers' calls, and that's always a challenge. Um, but. We're really looking for some leadership from the federal government here, Mr. Speaker, because you cannot build things in the pathway of an airport uh, contrary to federal government fly and approach and rules, Mr. Speaker. Yes, so I've offered many times to meet with the member opposite. I've offered offer to, to sit down. I've actually had <clears throat> met with people from the airport and that, and we need greater clarity from them. We are following Thank our rules. We'll follow our EAA process. We're looking for. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Premier, uh, all four surrounding municipalities are against this project. They would like their planning power back so that at least they would have the common sense and wisdom to not put these damn things next to an airport. It's insane what you're doing. It's insane that you would say one thing in the area just before you're elected leader and then not do the review that you said you would do, or at least I'm not aware that you've done it, and that this process just keeps plowing ahead. It doesn't make any sense. And Minister, I say to you, the federal government has no rules about wind turbines near airports because they didn't need to develop rules because the municipalities used to have the planning tools to make sure this wouldn't happen. So they're looking at you like a bunch of dummies that you would actually do this in the first place. And, that's, and, and, and they're just saying, well, give back the planning power. So why don't you do that? Why don't you give these municipalities and all the municipalities across rural Ontario the authority they deserve? They can tell you where to put your garage and where to place your house.
Thank you. Minister. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't know quite what to say, Mr. Speaker, after that, other than the member should really be the member representing the member from Bruce Gray and Sam will come to order second time. Finish, please. After that dramatic performance, the member should be representing the community of Stratford, Mr. Speaker. That's a, <laughs> an Academy Award winning performance. Member from here on, Bruce, will come to order. Thank you. I, the, I, I know the minister. The uh, member from here on, Bruce, will come to order a second time. And if I knew where the direction was, I'd warn that mem member. It's not a laughing matter. Please finish. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're not interested in endangering the lives of Ontarians, and we also respect the constitutional the authority. Member from Stormont, know, come to order. I'm the member for Toronto Centre. I fly out of the island airport. There are very tall structures all around that, and, and we. Excuse me. Seated, please. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. Finish, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There's large smokestacks about. The member from about Renfrew, come to order. A little more fiber, a little less coffee, maybe, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Finish your answer. The, uh, you see it, please. New question. The member from Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Natural Resources, this is a question about priorities. No price was too high to bail out the government's Mars project, even though high-tech companies showed little interest in occupying the space. But a company is interested in taking over the Fort Francis Mill. There is a deal to be struck that would create and save 1,000 jobs in the Rainy River District. The people of Fort Francis don't need $300 million. We just need $5 million to save the mill from being destroyed this winter so that we can finalize a plan to keep the mill open and save 1,000 jobs. The clock is ticking. <clears throat> Will this government pay to heat the mill this winter? Thank you, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, Speaker, I, I've responded to this question in the House before, and when I responded to it last time, I advised the member in the House that we were investigating what possibilities there might be around this, uh, should the eventuality arise that has arisen, that being that the business-to-business -business relationship that was trying to be struck between the owner of the mill, Resolute Forest Products, and the potential purchaser uh, of the mill, Expera, fell apart. The deal did fall apart, but I'm saying here, as I said back then, that even before that had occurred, even before the member was on her feet uh, asking this particular question, we had already begun to see what was possible in that regard, should we be needed to step in to see what we can do. I said that a couple of weeks ago. I'll see it, say it here again today. I have nothing to announce today. We're investigating the possibility to see what we might be able to do, and hopefully we'll have a response on that in the not-too-distant future. Here, here. We've been in contact with the owner of the mill. There is still an opportunity. Uh, uh, we understand time is short to make a final decision in that regard. We're on it. We're looking into what's possible. It is still a privately owned mill. I Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary. This government has bent over backwards to bail out the Mars project, spending over $300 million. Order, please. Se Sergeant at Arms. Thank you. Also stand recess for f for five minutes.
Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This government bent over backwards to bail out its Mars project, spending over $300 million for a two-thirds empty building. But when the people of the Rainy River District asked the government to help save 1,000 jobs that depend on the Fort Francis Mill, we get only excuses. As you can tell by the ice on the ground, winter is here. If the Fort Francis Mill is not heated, it will be damaged and lost forever. Minister, it's simple. The government could find $300 million for Mars. Will the government find $5 million to save 1,000 jobs and heat the mill this winter? Thank you. Speaker, thank you again. I thank the member for the question. As I've mentioned on several occasions, we were investigating this possibility long before the NDP were on their feet talking about or asking this particular question a long time ago. I also think, Speaker, that it is a bit disingenuous for the member to get on her feet and suggest with apparently some certainty that there is a deal, a deal to be done here. There is no guarantee that a deal can be done here. It is just as disingenuous to say that as it is to suggest to the people— You, you have to withdraw. 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 I think it is, Speaker, uh, unfortunate language to somehow be conveying to the people of Fort Francis that there is some guarantee of a deal to be done, as it is unfortunate to convey to the people of Fort Francis that with a stroke of a pen somehow we could have fixed this particular deal. The tenure system that is in place today is one that was created by the NDP in 1994. Answer. It's a system that we moved forward with legislatively in 2011 to change. Even if the new change was in place, it would not have guaranteed a deal in any particular way. Speaker. So Monsieur le Président, ma question est pour le ministre des Affaires municipales et du Logement. Minister, as you're well aware, on October 27th, people across Ottawa and Ontario came together to elect our municipal leader and school board trustees. All told, approximately 28 council members and 700 trustees were elected from the thousands of candidates to put their name on a ballot. While local elections have now drawn to a close, the work ahead for both our government and our municipal partners is really just beginning. Throughout the province, including my riding of Ottawa Orléans, where four councillors have been sworn in, including one newly elected member on December 1st, the province is readying for new municipal governments. All the provincial, at the provincial level, Minister, you and your staff are beginning a review of the Municipal Election Act and is typical after every municipal election cycle. Minister, can you tell us at this point about where you stand on municipal election electoral reform, please? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Excellent. Well, thanks for that great question. I don't mind uh, telling you where I stand on municipal reform. I stand uh, uh, with any change that makes sense and has a lot of support from our municipal leaders and our stakeholders, as well as the people of Ontario. So that's why we're consulting. Uh, we'll be consulting uh, broadly with AMO, the uh, Ontario uh, elections people, and uh, other, uh, other stakeholders. But before I say anything more, I, I just want to take a moment to congratulate the 2,800 or so uh, folk uh, who stood for election as mayor or okay. councillor. Absolutely. And the 700, uh, uh, Madam Minister, who stood for uh, school board trustee, yeah, it takes a lot of courage to put your name on a ballot Indeed it does. and to go out in the public and talk about uh, your hopes and dreams and to listen to the hopes and dreams of others and to respond. So uh, congratulations uh, to the folk. Uh, I know I, I can speak for the Premier when I, when I say we're uh, we're going to be uh, looking uh, forward to working closely Thank with you. them. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, for constituents of my riding of Ottawa, Orleans, and communities across the province, municipal electoral reform is a hot button issue. After all, municipal elections are the fundamental way that Ontarians can engage this government and make their voices heard on the issues that affect their lives on a daily basis. During Ottawa's local election, I've been offered no shortage in suggested change to the ways our municipal elections are conducted. I know the minister will share my sentiment and enthusiasm surrounding local government and how we can choose to elect local officials in something that we at the provincial level must encourage. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister share some details about how the review of the Municipal Election Act 
will will welcome input. In addition, what do you hope to question? What, what do your hope? Um, uh, what do you hope the review will achieve? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Well, I hope. I hope, Mr. Speaker, the uh, review will achieve great things. Uh, great things. Uh, I know I speak for the Premier when I, I say we look forward to working to the new municipal leaders. It's a uh, core principle um, of uh, our government that after every election we review the Municipal Elections Act. I would welcome the honourable member who's, who has said she's heard many ideas from her constituents to share those uh, those with me and anyone else who has ideas as well. We intend to invite the public to submit their thoughts, and we're getting some of that. Um, uh, we'll organize uh, post-election meetings with AMO and uh, Mr. Speaker, other stakeholders, because we think it's important to hear uh, directly uh, from those. Um, Answer. As you may know, the Premier has, uh, has directed in my mandate letter uh, that we'll be providing municipalities with the op option to uh, introduce ranked balloting. We intend Thank to move Thank you. New question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Speaker, Speaker, my question is the Attorney General. Minister, yesterday I had asked at the, about you about David McPherson, the Londoner tragically killed in a fire that engulfed the unlicensed group home he was forced to live in. Days before this fatal fire took place, a manager from your ministry's office of the P Ontario Public Guardian Trustee toured the building. Despite all the health and safety violations charged against this home, you claimed in this very house yesterday that the Office of the Public Guardian Trustee does not make personal decisions for their clients, recommend or refer clients to this type of housing. Instead, this office is satisfied with allotting the funds needed to sustain people in substandard housing and pass the buck on to the next ministry. Minister, will you admit that because of your government's inability to provide quality services to our most desperate citizens, this tragedy occurred? Good Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, you know, like I offer my deepest sympathy to the family and friends of uh, the uh, gentleman that uh, perished in, uh, after uh, being uh, in this uh, building after the fire. And uh, it's, uh, it's very important that, uh, you know, all the uh, members who uh, are the, all the uh, agencies that uh, deal with these uh, uh, individuals work together to make sure that this does not happen again. As I said yesterday, you know, uh, the, uh, we are not uh, the, the uh, agency that the, uh, uh, the, the member is speaking about are only responsible for uh, administering the uh, monetary administration, but uh, I, uh, I know that the uh, City of London uh, is going to look into it and work with, uh, with our, um, the Ministry of uh, Community you. and Social Services to make sure that this does not happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, you're talking more about passing the buck down to the municipality of London. Maybe you should take a stand and stand up for the people of Ontario. Here, here, here. The police department has visited this facility over 100 times in 2014. Red flags were everywhere, health, safety, fire and zoning violations, violations, but still some of our most vulnerable citizens in London were living in those conditions. This tragedy could have been prevented if your government acted on the 2011 mental health strategy to ensure safe, stable housing. Instead, that part of the strategy remains on a standing item at the Deputy Minister's Social Policy Committee. Your ministry needs to take action and demand answers about this strategy. You owe it to the people of London. Minister, will you confirm today that your ministry will call a coroner's inquest into the death of Londoner Dave McPherson? You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. The uh, Minister of uh, Public Safety and Correction. Minister of Public Safety. Thank you very Community much. Safety uh, and Corrections. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I appreciate the question from the member opposite. And and of course, uh, our our, uh, uh, our condolences goes uh, to the victims' family for this uh, for this uh, tragedy. And of course, we all have to resolve that these type that we prevent these type of tragedies from uh, from taking place. The member raised uh, the question around uh, asking the coroner uh, to do an inquest. I the think the member from member Duffer, opposite, come to order. Uh, knows quite well that uh, uh, a coroner is an independent uh, officer uh, who makes uh, determination 
um, on, on the facts of the case uh, on his own, whether to hold an inquest or not. There is no capacity uh, or capability on part of the government or I as the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services to ask the coroner to do an inquest. So I leave it up to, I leave it up to the coroner yes, to make that determination. Thank, Thank you. you. The uh, member from Parkdale High Park on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. According to a Standing Order 99D, ministries have 24 sessional days to answer written questions. I want to draw uh, your attention to page 14 on the order paper where I've asked three questions of the Minister of Transportation and I have received absolutely no answer. That is a point of order. and. Uh that is a point of order, and uh, I will remind the minister that, uh, indeed, that uh, the time frame in which they are to respond is on, um, and, and I believe it's overdue, so we'll uh, make sure that that happens. The, uh, member, the member from uh, Huron-Bruce on a point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the Ontario Environment Industry Association. They represent some of Ontario's most innovative environment and clean tech companies. We look forward to working with you in the coming year. The uh, member from Kitchener-Waterloo on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to correct my record. Yesterday, in responding to the uh, economic uh, fall economic statement, I quoted that 53% of children in Toronto live in poverty. I was quoting the poverty-free Toronto report. In fact, the number is 63% of children in some Toronto neighbourhoods live in poverty. Thank you. The, uh, that is a point of order, and all members are uh, eligible to correct their own record. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport on a point of order. Here. I'd like to uh, welcome a uh, former colleague from the uh, House of Commons, my friend uh, Jennifer Sloan, to the uh, Legislature. Welcome. We have a deferred vote on a motion for allocation of time on Bill 8, an act to promote public sector and MPP accountability and transparency by an act. By enacting the broader Public Sector Executive Compensation Act 2014, call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, take your seats, please. On November the 17th, Mr. Nackby moved to government notice of motion number eight. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Dakar. Mr. Dakar. Mr. Berard. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkis. Mr. Balkis. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jasso. Mr. Jasso. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Demolin. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Uh, Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Uh, Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Mr. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Cam Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. The nays are 45. The ayes being 56 and the nays being 45, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Kenora-Rainy River has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry concerning the Fort Francis Mill. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. The uh, Member the member from Parkdale High Park um, asked on a point of order today. The answers to your questions on the order paper have been tabled this morning. There are no further debate. Uh, there are no further votes. This house deferred votes. This house stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.